Welcome back, everyone. I think we're at about Genesis 4, verse 17-ish. Thereabouts. Last we left off, Canaan was east of Eden, settling in, in the land of Nod. He is a, a, an accursed wanderer upon the earth. He's been marked that no one would kill him. Uh, but he is also going to father his own nation. And, and when we encounter this word nation in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, we mean a people descended from, a, from someone, right? So the race of Adam or the nation of Adam or the generations of Adam, these words are going to be more or less interchangeable. That means everyone descended from Adam, which is man, right? Convenient, because Adam means man, right? So when we talk about man or mankind, we mean the race of Adam, the nation of Adam, right? Cain is going to have his own nation. They're going to have their own um, identity. And we're going to learn about them right now. So let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice at your goodness in sending your Son to be born for us, that he would go to the cross and die our death, that we might live forever and be restored to the image in which you created us. Bless us now as we study your word, that we may see not only what we have lost, but especially what you have restored in that same Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay. So verse 17, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Mahushael, and Mahushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabel, he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. So here we have the descendants of Cain, right? And we're not told a lot, but um, Enoch is, is going to be the the namesake of the city. And here you have several generations, and Lamech is going to be kind of the next major figure that we see. Lamech takes two wives, right? And two Lamech and those two wives are born some children, right? And we see that uh, Jabel is the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. Um, probably nomadic you know, tents, not buildings, right? Then you've got Jubal, right? Um, they're playing music with instruments. That sounds wholesome, because we like instruments. But remember that, like any tool, it can be used for good or for evil, right? And as we read about the nation of Cain, Cain and his descendants, we know something of their character, and we, and we note that paganism also engages in music. I was going to say, they don't sound so bad, and they were cursed. They don't sound so bad when, when that's all you look at. Now, when, when you get to the next verses, you'll, you'll see how it goes. But, um, so they're playing the lyre and the pipe. And I mean, there, there's always been music in service of wickedness. Whether, you know, Arius had children's songs singing about there was a time when the Son of God was not. I mean, utterly blasphemous. Um, or, 
you know, just, just general popular and folk music has often been used to extol the pagan virtues of the people. And that's, that seems like that's what's going on here with, with Tubal Cain. Oh, sorry, with, um, with Jubal. And then you've got Tubal Cain, instruments of bronze and iron. What do you use bronze and iron for at this time? Violence, right. So you, you can use it for other things, but given what we see of, of, of Lamech and, um, and his boast, my assumption is that Tubal Cain and his and his metals were not used for good. Yeah, and and when when you look at the record before the flood, you realize the world was a different place, a wildly different place. Lifespans, but also, you know, if, if you have access to people that are six, seven, eight, nine hundred years old, you can develop technology. I mean to say nothing of virtue um, or true knowledge of God, you can develop technology and culture at levels we can't. And it's, and it's rather evident that the, that the earliest people were far smarter, far more organized, far more intentional, both for good or evil, than what we've become accustomed to in the 21st century A.D., like we were a well, that's, that's the thing, right? Is we're all taught, oh, back in the day, everyone had sloped foreheads and they dragged their knuckles when they walked and they didn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. But. We know better. Yeah. But we know things because we have to look up basic arithmetic on our iPhones. <clears throat> so, verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So they knew of Cain's sin, his transgression. They knew of his, of his mark and the, the vengeance that would be meted out on whoever killed Cain. Right, Whoever kills Cain will be avenged sevenfold. So Lamech, he kills a man for what? Just for hitting him. So he, he's bragging of, of what a brutal sort of man he is. <laughs> yeah, but, but this is the thing, right? In, in, in the Mosaic Law... And, and even in man's positive law, even in this wicked age, there's at least a sense that the punishment for the sin or the punishment for the crime ought to be proportional to the crime committed. Now, whether or not that actually happens in man's law is another question, but there's at least the sense in jurisprudence that you don't, you don't overpunish, right? The punishment has to fit the actual crime. And so if someone kills Cain, he's going to die. Well, Lamech has said, I killed a man just for, just for wounding me. That's, that's what the sons of Cain are like. But now we're back to Adam, because remember, Adam's not dead. We're several generations out. Adam's not dead. He's going to live a nice, long life. He might grumble about whether it's nice to live that long. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for uh, Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, so um, Seth, like most names, indicates who he is or what people think of of him. Seth means appointed, or something like the word for appointed, right? Because remember, when when Eve gave birth to Cain, she said, I've begotten a man, the Lord. And, you know, Cain obviously was not the Messiah. Um, Abel, of course, was dead. 
So they have another son and and Eve and, and Adam say, well, this, this one has been appointed, right? Because remember, they still believe the promise. They still believe that God will send a seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head. And so they figure it's he's the one appointed. Look at just a, a the last half of verse 26. At that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. What is Moses describing? This is the Christian church. This is, they're, they're worshiping the Lord, they're calling on his name, right? If a Christian is one who is justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ, then Abraham is one, and Noah is one, and Adam is one. I mean, they're sinners, but they call on the name of the Lord, right? Same as us. In the Old Testament, how are you justified? By faith alone. Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. In the New Testament, under the New Covenant, how is one righteous before God? By faith alone, not by works of the law. Right? So, it's important for us to to make this point, and we'll make it again, because there is a pervasive misunderstanding and it has many, many, many forms but many, many folks have the understanding that in the Old Testament, they were justified by their keeping of the law, or by the sacrifices, or worse, by, by the genetic line, which is what the Pharisees thought, especially in John's Gospel, by the genetic line being an ancestor of Abraham. And yet Abraham himself is justified before God by faith alone. Abraham believed the Lord, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. And by the way, I, I'm like 80% certain that verse is the most cited verse of the entire book of Concord. This is the very same word that is used when Moses is told who's sending him, right? I am, right? The Lord. Jehovah, Yahweh, the, the Tetragrammaton, um, that same name for the Lord. So they're they're not just calling on any old God. They're calling on the Lord, the same Lord we pray to. Chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And remember, we talked the very first time we met about how Genesis is divided. You can divide Genesis in many different ways. One of the most common is the way that Moses himself does, and that is into ten... Uh, the Hebrew word is toledoth, uh, generations, um, ages, if you want. Um, and so the first one was the generations of the heavens and the earth. Now, chapter 5, these are the generations of Adam, right? So Adam and those who come after him. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Right? So again, just, just to go over this, when man was first created, whose likeness did he bear? God. Right? Verse 2. Male and female he created them, and he blessed them, and named them man when they were created. So again, God named them man, and made them male and female. So male and female are part of God's design. They've always been there. They're not socially conditioned or artificial constructs. And there's only two. Right, right, yeah, yeah. You click the face, Facebook drop down on the gender selection tool as a, as a scroll wheel. That's a problem. Um, yeah, just male and female. And by the way, you know how seriously someone takes what, what you are by what they put on the gender thing. Like, um, if you're going in for surgery, it's male or female. I, I hope. Last time it was. Um, <laughs> God help you if your surgeon actually thinks there's more than that. Um, okay. But again, when, when man is created, 
And when we mean man, we mean man and the woman from man. He bore the image of God. Verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Huge, huge implications in this verse. Because remember, when man is created, he bears the image of God. But now, now that Adam has transgressed, now whose image is, is man born into? Adam. Now all of us are born into the image of Father Adam, not the image of God. If you are going to get the image of God, you have to be born differently. You have to have a different kind of birth. You have to have a birth from above. This is precisely what Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus, who is, by the way, a rabbi and a teacher of the Jews, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus, as a scholar, should have known this. He had Genesis. Likely would have been studying it in the Greek. It's very clear in the Greek that Adam was created in the image of God, but after the fall, all of Adam's descendants are born into the image of Adam, not in the image of God. If you're to get the image of God, you have to be born differently, which is exactly what Jesus tells Nicodemus. You must be born from above, or as our English translations sometimes render it, you must be born again, right? And by the way, your English translators missed it the same way Nicodemus does, because Nicodemus goes, what, am I supposed to crawl back into my mother and be born a second time? The, the word is not, again, it's from above, right? It's, it's not being born a second time, it's a different sort of birth. And Jesus tells us in John 3, it's a birth of water and the Spirit. Yeah, I mean, born of water and the Spirit. Well, where, where do water and the Spirit come together? Baptism, right. What's the difference between the image of God and the image of Adam? Well, what was the image of God? We talked about this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a moral righteousness, right? It, it's, it was original righteousness. That's what gets lost. That Adam bears the image of God, that gets lost. Now Adam bestows his own image, which is corruption. It's, it's corrupted. It's lost that original righteousness so that now all of the faculties that God gave man to use in service to God, man will now by nature use to serve himself, the flesh, the world, or the devil. So for example... God really loves to build things. He loves to create things, make things. He loves beauty. But as you know, beauty can be used in service of evil, right? Now, at that point, it becomes a distortion of beauty. But you can, you can look at some of the works of the pagans and recognize they're using a gift that was supposed to be used in service of, to God, you know, for example, paintings of, of some of the Greek gods or statues to the Greek gods. They're skillful, but they're in service of evil. So man likes to make music, but music can be in service of evil. Even skillful music can be in service of evil. Right? Like Lohengrin, that opera from Wagner. Um... The plot of Lohengrin is disgusting. Why that started to be used as, as wedding music, I'll never know. Because if you look at what, what's going on in there, it's gross. So, so in other words, God gives capabilities to man, capacities to man he doesn't give to the other animals. Language, um, art, building, society, um, all these complex relationships. Man will pervert every one of those in service to evil. However, not entirely. There will be a remnant preserved at all times that will use what God gave them to glorify him, right? Even as Adam is still alive and bearing children, at 130, <laughs> man, having kids is a game for the young. 130? Wow. I mean, th that's the thing. Is like he's, 
at 130, he's having kids. I mean, that's that's what I say. the 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 order of the of the earth prior to the flood is just so vastly different than what we know, which is, which we should remember when we get to chapter six, which is the subject of so much speculation. Um, we just have to remember that everything is not exactly the way that we know it now, especially after the flood. So, um, in verse 4, the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Not the longest lifespan recorded in Scripture, but pretty close. Right? Um, he lives 930 years. Which means, Adam, I mean, you, you all know that the world was different 10, 15, 50, 70 years ago. How much corruption did Adam see in his days? How much weariness must that have produced in him? So, yeah, he, so here we're, we are explicitly told, it's not a matter of conjecture, but we're explicitly told he had other sons and daughters. Right? So, this is also informative for when we're looking at the genealogies. These genealogies are never intended to be comprehensive or unabridged. There's always the possibility that other branches are left out simply because it's not relevant to the story being told at that time for that purpose, right? So in other words, we're given three named children of Adam and Eve, but we know that doesn't mean they only had three children. One, it logically doesn't make sense, but two, Moses explicitly tells us and that can be informative on down the line. Verse 6, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahaliel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahaliel 840 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahaliel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahaliel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years, and he died. Okay, so just, just looking at these last few generations, you all know how, how trends work, right? Trends describe things as a generality, but not necessarily every single element in the set, right? So the line doesn't have to be perfectly smooth in one direction to accurately describe a trend, right? So like, you know, if, if, if GDP is falling, but like one year it peaks, that doesn't mean that GDP isn't falling, right? I don't know why people get into this weird nominalist, like, if I find one exception, then that disproves the whole generality. Like, people have two legs. Well, I know this guy that doesn't. Okay, but that doesn't change the fact that, right, that's called the exception that proves the rule. So, likewise, we see the trend here that, first of all, the age of fathering their first children is going down. Yeah, there's a weird thing in the Bible where the law explicitly says the, 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 the inheritance goes to the firstborn, and yet the firstborn rarely inherits. These are all going to be in the line of Jesus. This is, this is specifically the line of Jesus, right? There is one line that goes from Adam to Jesus that the Bible is constantly going to shine the spotlight on. And that line is going to have some weird, weird stories. And God is going to have to perform some straight-up miracles to keep that line alive, open, continuing. I mean, it's, it's, and it's not just the virgin birth, and that's part of it, but um, Judah almost gets cut off at the generation of Judah. Yep, yep. In, in Wednesday, in the book of Ruth, Ruth shines the light on just three or four generations there leading up to David. Right? And, and how Ruth the Moabite gets grafted in, though she had no business being, here she is. She believes she's living as a Judahite with Naomi. 
She's worshiping their God, the true God, the same one we worship, and now she's an ancestor of David, the climactic king. Um, Tamar is a wild story, we're, and we're we're going to get to Tamar because she's in Genesis. Then there's Rahab, right? We we saw her in Joshua. Yes, yeah. He's he's omnipotent, and he absolutely delights in using the foolish to shame the wise. Yeah. There's no reason for this person to be, and yet here, you know, here they are. These these people who are the least, the overlooked, the people that are the foolish. He uses them. I mean. The, 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 the greatest of the apostles in terms of their writing is the last one. The one who only saw him at the very tail end, risen, taught in, for three years in Arabia, um, and who, who was there overseeing the martyrdom of the first Christian. And God says, I'm going to use you to be the great apostle of the Gentiles. What? God, I mean, God delights in these stories of using the foolish to shame the wise, the weak to shame the strong, and so forth. Major, major theme, by the way, of Luke's gospel. Okay, so, but, but you, get the, you get the trend, right? In each of these generations, he fathered a child, they live after they fathered a child for a very long time, have other sons and daughters, and then they die, right? Because each one ends, and he died. Now notice... You can have access to like stupid kinds of money, like Apple CEO type stupid money. Right. How long can that stupid kind of money prolong death or, 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 or keep death away? Can't. Right. Even if you manage to keep your body alive, even these men that lived over 900 years, they still died. This is going to be the fact, the ironclad fact of human existence. So now let's read about Enoch. So when Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the, the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, I mean, you guys know how the story's going, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and then, you know, the rest, and then he died. Except, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's right. His story goes differently. Right? Every one of these stories is like a cut and paste of the last. He had he fathered children, he had other children, he lived for a long time, and then he died. Yeah. Right. Hebrews 11.5 tells us about Enoch, because sometimes it's claimed, well, we don't know that that means he didn't die. Maybe, maybe not, but Hebrews 11.5 makes it clear he didn't die. Yeah. Right. In fact, we're going to have the same thing later on in church, because... There was someone else who didn't die, and that is Elijah. And the Pharisees thought, well, the fact that Elijah didn't die means, and we know that Elijah's going to come again. So obviously, John the Baptist thinks he's Elijah because they're all waiting for Elijah to come again in the flesh. And of course, the prophet is saying he's going to come in the spirit of Elijah, in the office of Elijah, but Elijah's not going to come back like the same prophet. And that's, that's the whole confusion of today's gospel reading, but I'll save that for the sermon. So, that's right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, now you know like two whole paragraphs of the sermon. Um, so Enoch is different. What do we know of Enoch? What makes him different? His faith right? Again, it's, it's no coincidence that the place you find out about him in the New Testament is Hebrews 11.5. Hebrews 11 is that great hall of fame of the saints that we've been using both in our Genesis study and in our book of Judges study because you get kind of the bookend like Samson. Samson's a pretty iffy sort of character if you just read the, the description in the book of Judges, and yet in, in Hebrews 11 we're told he's listed among the faithful. And Talk about an imperfect saint. 
Wow. Wildly imperfect. And yet, here the Bible is saying he's commended for his faith. He's listed among all the, others, all the other great heroes of the faith. So Enoch, he walked with God, and that's not like a one-time deal, right? The, the way this is phrased is, this was his manner of living. He, he lived walking with God. In other words, his, his whole life was one of faithfulness. And not just an internal faithfulness, but a faithfulness that expressed itself outwardly. But yeah, we're not, we're not given a lot of words in the Bible about him, and yet this is, this is very unusual. A man who not only lived so long, but then who never died. And of course, he fathers Methuselah, right? We know Methuselah because every single Bible trivia you ever knew had Methuselah in there, right? Verse 25. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands." Let's stop right there for just a second. I mean, yes, this is the same Noah we all know. Um, and so you, you see where this is building, right? It's not a mistake that Noah comes as the grandson of Enoch, the faithful, right? When you look at Cain's generations, the generations that come after Cain look a lot like Cain, right? Right? And the generations that come after Adam look a lot like Adam. They're sinful, but they also call on the name of the Lord. And now you've got Enoch. He walked with God and the Lord took him. And now his grandson is going to be the one to give him relief because at this point, the faithful are really feeling the, the curse. I mean, look at the way they describe this. You know, um, He's going to bring us relief from our work and the painful toil of our hands. And by the way, relief from work sounds a lot like what? The Sabbath. How many generations since Adam? I think this is seven, isn't it? By the time we get to Noah... How long has the world been around? About 1,500 years. It's a long time. I mean, 1,500 years ago, Rome had only fallen for about a century. But yeah, you're, you're right. The Eastern, the Eastern Roman Empire is still going in Constantinople. But I mean, 1,500 years ago, that's a long time. And, and just from Adam until where we are now with, with Noah just being born, um, a lot has happened. And we're told almost none of it. <laughs> we're told who lived and how long. One of the things that we know is going on is, of course, what? Sin. Sin is the big story, right? I mean, okay, sin is always the big story, but the world has gotten especially bad. And we're going to find that out, especially in how the Lord speaks in chapter 6. But, um, because remember, we followed the line that leads to Noah, the one righteous man left. I mean, not to spoil the plot or anything, but like, <laughs> you know what's coming with Noah. He's the one righteous guy left. All these others are still founding their own nations, and they're, founding, they're settling their own cities, and they're engaging in who knows what. But you can imagine that whatever it is, it's evil. I mean, the Lord's going to say as much in the next chapter. But um, So we, we follow this line that leads to Noah, and so they're already calling for relief. They want rest, right? Because they're really feeling the effects of the curse. 
Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And those, those three names, of course, are very important, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, because all, right, all humanity is descended from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Chapter 6. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any as they chose. Okay, so nothing to unpack here. Let's keep moving. Um, <laughs> uh, I almost got away with it. Um, there's, 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 there's a lot going on here, and a lot of it we're not taught. Um, what, what, what does it mean, the sons of God, and what does it mean, the daughters of man? Well, one thing that you can see is this story does get repeated throughout the Old Testament, where, right, these, these whatever, whatever the ontological nature of these beings was, these marriages were unapproved. That is to say, you have wicked men and virtuous women Tale as old as time. Um, You have wicked men, virtuous women, godly men, other way around, ungodly men, godly women. Um, And of course, what happens? Do the wicked get turned in such a circumstance? It happens, but not really, not usually. Usually what happens is exactly what St. Paul warns us about. Bad company corrupts good morals. And so you have these wicked unbelievers. They're marrying the virtuous women. And now the corruption is being multiplied on the earth. Exactly. Israel is, is explicitly commanded not to intermarry with the Canaanites. They do, and it brings them no end of trouble. Men fell for a pretty face. And godly women got a pretty face. I mean, that's, that's how it's going. And um, they, they took as their wives any they chose. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be a hundred twenty years. Okay. Remember that thing that happened to David when he drove out the Holy Spirit and he went in with Bathsheba and he brought all kinds of calamity upon himself, his nation, his house, and his son? Remember what he prayed when he was restored to the faith? It's, we call it Psalm 51. And what does he pray in Psalm 51? Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Right? He's been there. He doesn't ever want that again. He doesn't want to be separated from God's Spirit. And by the way, your Bible should be capitalizing the essence Spirit. This is not just the essence of God. This is the third person of the Trinity who dwells with man and brings to him the promises of God in Christ. Psalm 51. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and we're explicitly told in the Bible this was... After David had gone in with Bathsheba, he writes this. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of like the chief theme of Ash Wednesday, right? Um, it is it is the psalm for Ash Wednesday and the intro it, but it's also kind of the theme of the day. So, so yeah, so there there is kind of a dual meaning in this 120 years, right? The days of man shall be 120 years. Does it mean? that the Lord is going to flood the earth in 120 years, doesn't mean that man's life is basically capped at 120 years from this point on. It seems to me as though both are are true. Um, Because how long does it take Noah to build the ark? 100 years. It's big! And he's just one guy, and he's 500 years old. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, it takes him 100 years. So the, 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 if, if 120 years until the flood is what is intended, 
I think the text works here pretty well. On the other hand, what does experience tell us? Can, can you really, following the flood, do you really live past 120? Well, he does. <laughs> no, yeah, Noah will. But of those born after the flood, it just doesn't really happen. All right, verse 4, we're just going to skip that one. So, <laughs> Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. So, yeah, so Nephilim is just a straight transliteration of the Hebrew. Um, in, in the Greek, it's going to be the Megale or the, the, the giants. Um, Nephilim almost has a, um, a connotation in the Hebrew of like a cloud dweller, cloud people. Um, exactly who these are has been the subject of endless, and man, I do mean endless, speculation. You can find whole books written on who are these people. And it ranges anywhere from a very naturalistic, they were just tall people like us, to they were a whole different race of like angel-human hybrids, and everywhere, everywhere in between. The fact of the matter is, one, we really can't know much for certain, and two, what we speculate, we cannot be dogmatic about. And the reason is because Moses doesn't give, an, give us any more than this. They were... So there, there's a book of the pseudepigrapha called the Book of Enoch that describes these things, but understand that that book is not authoritative except in one place, which is quoted in the book of Jude, and because it's quoted in the book of Jude, we can say it is the word of God. Um, that makes the whole thing kind of sticky and, and a little bit difficult to, to unwind, but for the most part, the book of Enoch is, is interesting. It, um, it can be useful, um, but it's not, it's not gonna, we're not going to regard it as the word of God except in the one place where it is. Yes, but the, the other connotation, that, and what is important for us to know about the Nephilim, whoever they were, is that they were basically, um, not only were they wicked, they were also oppressive. Right? Part, part of the wickedness going on on the earth was one of oppression, right? Of power being used to squash the, the low, right? And, you know, Goliath comes from one of the wickedest nations ever to live on the earth. So, I mean, it, it stands to reason. All right, we'll cut here, and then we'll pick it up um, next week, verse 5. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.